the last talk of the two-day Eminent Scholar Lecture Series. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Dave Hutton. He received his PhD from the University of California in Santa Cruz in 1994 and then did a postdoc at the University of New York Stony Brook. He then joined the faculty at the University of Delaware and more recently joined the faculty at the University of Southern California where he is now a professor and section head of biological sciences for the Doran Sith College of Art and Sciences. His talk today is entitled The Evolutionary Surprises Within the Future Ocean Nitrogen Cycle, Adaptation of Nitrogen Fixing Cyanobacteria to Environmental Change. Welcome, David. Well, thanks, Kendra, and thanks for inviting me. It's been a really nice experience getting to know some of you. It's the first time I've been here. I'm going to talk about a theme that Rob introduced very nicely uh, yesterday, and that's environmental change. We all know that's happening. We all know that our species has now become one of the dominant biogeochemical forces on the planet. Not, not always with good results, right? Some people would make a case that we're kind of a plague on the uh, planet, as a matter of fact, like this cartoonist. Uh, um, the point uh, is being made that, uh, yeah, we're doing a lot of damage to the Earth's ecosystems uh, through our consumption of fossil fuel and of uh, other resources. But coming here to give this talk is a little bit daunting because, as Rob also pointed out, we read in the newspapers and we know that your governor <laughs> won't allow us to use this word. So I tried to get climate change completely out of my talk. I uh, also, I'm not going to say the S word because I understand that's forbidden too. And uh, we talked yesterday about this one, but I definitely won't talk about sea level rise because Governor Scott doesn't like any of those words. Although for the last one, I was reading Carl Hyassen's uh, column in the Miami Herald a few uh, weeks ago. I loved uh, his suggestion to replace sea level rise with permanent high tide. <laughs> He's a funny guy. I, I like to read his columns. But one thing that the governor has not forbidden us to talk about, as far as I know, is ocean acidification. He's probably never heard of it. But <laughs> You've heard of it. You know what's going on. You know that as we burn all this fossil fuel gigatons of carbon per year, this is a nice little fit figure about from 10 years ago, the Royal Society report, the PCO2 in the atmosphere obviously is going up, but a lot of that's going into the ocean. And this shows the predicted invasion of uh, anthropogenic CO2 and the results on the pH of the ocean over the next few hundred years. I know you've all heard of this, and I'm not going to dwell on it. What I want to talk about today, though, is the response of ocean biology to that. Sometimes we seem to assume that lowering the pH of the ocean is going to be a bad deal for everybody in the ocean. And if you're talking about corals, if you're talking about any kind of calcifying organisms, there's no doubt uh, acidification is a bad thing, but just like any other environmental change, some organisms are going to like this. There's always some weedy organism that will come in and take advantage of an environmental change. And even for the ones that are negatively affected, one of the big questions that we have and that we can't answer yet usually is whether they're going to be able to adapt to these changes. They're happening very rapidly. Uh, in other words, um, I guess a biological term for that would be evolutionary rescue. Can organisms adapt fast enough to deal with the pace of pH and PCO2 changes that are going on in the ocean? And for a lot of things, that the answer is going to be no. Uh, whales and dolphins are never going to adapt because they only have a few generations between now and, say, the time when the, the pH of the ocean is down to 7.8 or 7.9. If you stop and think about it, or if you're a, an evolutionary biologist, you realize this. There's two ways 
that organisms can respond evolutionarily to climate change. Oh, I said that word. Um, the, to uh, ocean acidification, excuse me. Um, there can be selection based on genetic diversity that already exists in natural populations of marine organisms. So this is what we call species or strain sorting. Maybe there's genotypes out there that can tolerate pH that are already present within populations and they will gain a selective advantage as the chemistry of the ocean changes. The other type of evolution that could happen is new mutations arise in these populations over the course of uh, the next decades that allow particular individuals to have an advantage. So that's really two ways that marine organisms might be able to deal with changing pH in the ocean. And if you think about any group of marine organisms that has a chance to adapt by both of these mechanisms, it's the microbes, right? They, uh, they have some big advantages, phytoplankton and bacteria. First off, their population sizes are virtually infinite by our way of counting. That really helps if you're going to evolve. Another thing is they have very short generation time, so new, new mutations can spread very quickly through a population. And they also have a lot of nice tricks uh, where they can pass genes around in order to evolve. So if there's anything that's going to be able to tolerate the changes that we're putting into the ocean, it's not going to be the whales and dolphins, it's going to be the microbes. The ones I want to talk about today are some of my favorite bugs, and I think a lot of you are familiar with marine nitrogen fixers. Um, half of global nitrogen fixation maybe takes place in the ocean, most of it by cyanobacteria probably. Here's one of the ones that we've been studying for decades. This is Trichodesmium, a colonial cyanobacterium, and again, I probably don't need to introduce trichodesmium. You have big blooms right off the coast here. Um, but along with unicellular nitrogen fixers, like this Crocosphera here, these two groups together probably supply somewhere on the order of 50% of the new nitrogen coming into the oligotrophic ocean. So they're tremendously important to biogeochemical cycles, and probably a lot of you already know that. Now, what do we think controls the growth of these things in the ocean today? Well, they can fix nitrogen. Nitrogen limitation is not a problem. However, we think that they're largely limited in a lot of the ocean by the availability of iron and phosphorus. So here's an old model by Ilana Berman Frank. Those are the areas that have a lot of iron inputs from the uh, Sahara here, for instance, the North Atlantic are also where you predict to have a lot of nitrogen fixation. But other areas may be phosphorus limited. If there's a big input of, uh, of iron, this area actually may go phosphorus limited. And there's some evidence that the North Atlantic gyre can be phosphorus limited for nitrogen fixers. But what I think, and I'll come back to this later in my talk, is in most of the oligotrophic ocean, not all of it, but in most of it, there's not much iron and there's not much phosphorus. They're probably co-limited by both of these nutrients um, in large areas of the ocean. So this is what we think is the bottom-up controls on nitrogen fixation in the ocean. <coughs> Where does uh, CO2 fit into this? Well, we've been looking at this for a number of years. We've been asking the question, how will nitrogen fixation rates of uh, trichodesmium and crocosphera and other uh, marine nitrogen fixers is spawn to a high CO2 ocean? And the answer seemed to be pretty easy. Um, there was experiments done. Uh, most of these were done 10 years or less ago. Here's one I did right off your coast in a trichodesmium bloom out there uh, off the west coast of Florida. What I did is I took a, the bloom and I incubated it at 300 ppm CO2, roughly today's concentrations, or at least when I did the experiment, we're up to about 400 now. 
Uh, and I incubated them at roughly end of this century concentration, 750 ppm. So we did three experiments. And you can see in every case, we got higher nitrogen fixation rates at the high CO2 when we incubated them very briefly, 24 hours, anywhere from about a small change of about 6% to a relatively large change of about 40%. So they like high CO2. They fix more nitrogen under high CO2 conditions. But it, this experiment has the drawback of being very brief. And so one thing we can do is we can take cultures of things like trichodesmium and we can acclimate them for weeks or even months before we do the experiment. So we make sure that we're not looking at transient acclimation physiology. And this is a, oops, this is a, uh, just a um, summary of some papers that I put together back in 2009 of experiments that had been done up till then. Um, and this shows the increase in nitrogen fixation rates that people have found in lab cultures incubated at future CO2 levels relative to today's CO2 levels. And you can see in every experiment that's been published, uh, the nitrogen fixation rates go up anywhere from 30% to maybe 100% in a few cases, when you incubate them at, say, uh, simulated year 2100 uh, conditions. So trichodesmium and crocosphera and other uh, cyanobacterial nitrogen fixers, they could be some of the big winners in the future acidified ocean. They seem to like it. But what we're not accounting for, even in these acclimated cultures, is evolution. So we wanted to ask the question, how will these organisms respond evolutionarily to high CO2 ocean, to a low pH ocean? And to do this, we tried to look at both the mechanisms that I, um, that I mentioned earlier. So we did uh, some experiments to evaluate some of the existing diversity in these two genera with respect to CO2. This is uh, existing uh, differences that selection and, and uh, evolution can work on. And we also did some long-term experimental evolution studies, uh, kind of patterned after the famous ones that Rich Lenski has done over the years with uh, E. coli, where we've grown cultures for many, many years now, almost seven years, we've had trichodesmium growing at multiple CO2 levels. And uh, I'll show you the results of those in a few minutes. But let's take a look at this first. So we wanted to know how, how much diversity is there out there. And we can't really go out and evaluate that. So what we can do, luckily, we have a culture collection at USC that my colleague and, and collaborator Eric Webb maintains. And he's got a lot of isolates from all over the world. So we took these isolates that were, came from these various um, widely spaced uh, stations. And we did a very simple set of experiments. We simply grew them across a range of CO2. And we measured their nitrogen fixation rates and their growth rates. And we compared them. I'll show you the results of those. <coughs> This is the results we got for the trichodesmium isolates. And what you can see right away is you get a very nice saturation type curve. These curves fit Michaelis Menten kinetics very nicely. And what this tells us is that CO2 is acting just like a limiting nutrient. At very low levels, nitrogen fixation rates and growth rates are reduced, but then it's, they, oops, they saturate at, um, at some level up here and give you a V max. Um, uh, maybe a simplistic way to look at this is to compare the rate at today's concentration of CO2 and of the year 2100 and just say how much did they increase between those two, uh, those two time points or those two concentrations in our, uh, our experiments. So let this one up at the top went up 81% its nitrogen fixation rates between today's and the future, say, 2100. 
This one went up 65%. This one, however, only increased 7%. In other words, its nitrogen fixation rates are nearly saturated at present day um, concentrations of CO2. It's not going to really benefit much from it. And here's another one that went up by about 48%. And you can also see those a little bit more quantitatively with less arm waving by looking at the half saturation constants uh, for these curves, which range from 63 parts per million CO2 up to over 400. So there's almost a seven-fold difference in, in half saturation constants. In other words, there's a lot of diversity just in these four isotopes in terms of how they respond to changing CO2. We see the same thing in the um, unicellular nitrogen fixers. These are three crocospheras, and you can see if you, look, if you play that game again of looking between now and, uh, and the end of the century, they go up 37%, 3%, and 45%. And you can also see the differences in the K1 halves ranging from 134 to 330 or so ppm. So again, there's a lot of variability in these things. The different strains respond to CO2 in different ways. So what we did is we teamed up with a modeler, Al Tagliabue, who's uh, now at the um, University of Liverpool. And it was a very simple model that he built. He took a surface uh, PCO2 concentrations from a, a, a GCM model that he has. And he simply used our half saturation constants to look at how much nitrogen fixation could increase for these various strains over the next, uh, I guess, like 90 years. And this is what he came up with. So this is the one that is a very, the trichodesmium isolate, that is a very high half saturation constant. And if you look at this scale, you can see that its potential nitrogen fixation rates just due to CO2 alone could increase by 20, 25% over most of the oligotrophic ocean by the year 2100. On the other hand, this is the one that's almost saturated at present day CO2. It's not going to benefit that much. It's going to only be able to increase its uh, nitrogen fixation rates 10% or less. And we see the same thing with the unicellular nitrogen fixers. Some of them are going to really be able to increase their CO2, um, I mean their nitrogen fixation rates as CO2 goes up. And then others with, uh, with that have very low half saturation constants are not. So it looks like all other things being equal, and this is not addressing the importance of things like iron and phosphorus limitation, but all other things being equal, CO2 could sort these different isolates and favor the ones that can increase their nitrogen fixation rates, whereas these ones have nowhere to go, just relative to CO2. I'll come back to iron and phosphorus later. So our, our conclusion of this part of the study is that nitrogen fixation uh, half saturation constants uh, relative to CO2 are really variable among the strains and species, even of this small culture collection. We can, we're not sampling even an appreciable fraction. We just plucked a few cells out of the global ocean, and we still got this very diverse collection from, uh, with half saturation constants ranging from 63 to 408 ppm. And that suggests that CO2 can differentially control the rates of several of the isolates within each genus. There appear to be specialists for high and low CO2 concentrations. Because there's a lot of existing genetic diversity relative to CO2 in these, these two genera of N2 fixers, strain or species sorting could really happen. As atmospheric CO2 goes uh, up anthropogenically or as it goes down, say, in the last glacial maximum, you might switch the dominant strains or the dominant species uh, based on their ability to grow and fix nitrogen at these different CO2 levels. So I'm going to leave this part alone for now because I want to move on and talk to you about something that I'm more excited about right now, and that's our experimental evolution.
uh, um, work. As I said, we have a, this will address the other question. Can nitrogen fixers uh, evolve de novo with new mutations um, in order to adapt to high CO2? So what we did, is we took trichodesmium cultures, we grew them in steady state for, uh, I'll show you data from about five years, it's now up to about seven. So these, uh, these were going for uh, somewhere between 600 and 850 generations. We had six replicates each at 380 and 750 ppm. They're still growing today. But at the end of this selection period, we uh, took samples for physiology, growth in nitrogen fixation. But we also wanted to get some mechanistics of how their responses to, um, to CO2 were occurring. So we're doing omics on these. As a matter of fact, we're doing gene expression. We're doing genomics. And Max Saito at, uh, at Hui, who's a co-PI in this, is doing proteomics on these cultures as well. And the different treatments I'm going to show you are these four right here. So there's the 380 adapted ones who've been growing at this point for five years at 380. There's the, the high CO2 cell lines uh, growing at, at 750. But then what you do in one of these experiments, if you want to see if there's been a change, is at some point in your experimental evolution work, you have to do reciprocal transfers. So we did that. We took the 380 adapted cell lines and we switched them to 750. We increased the PCO2 for a couple of weeks. And we also took the high CO2 adapted cell lines, switched them back to low CO2 for a couple of weeks. And we made our measurements. Let me show you we got when we did that. This is a kind of a complicated graph, even though it's only a bar graph, but it, it has a lot of treatments. I'll walk you through it. So this is nitrogen fixation rates. This is the rate of the ancestral strain that before we began the experiment at 380 ppm. This is the rate of the, three, of the ancestral strain when you move it to 750, and I showed you some other experiments. It goes up. We know that in short-term experiments. But at the end of four and a half years of selection, what we had is here's the low CO2 treatment, not different from the ancestor. Here's the high CO2 treatment, still not different.